thank you Best Buy for sponsoring today's video. I just don't know where I would be without you guys. Stop. With you guys, I feel like I can just be myself. With you, I can just do it all. And you, you're just so simple. But what I need you both to understand is that you two are the most important thing in my life. It's just, hey, 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 hey. That's just a friend. No need to worry about it. Today's just about you guys. Dude, honestly, you're such a freak, bro. Keep doing your thing. It's all good. Yo, the phone wars I read online are actually so unfiltered. Anyways, look, there are so many flagship phones coming out. I can't get around all of them, especially if I'm trying to do six months with each one of them at a time in order to give you some solid feedback. Look, what matters is that I've done my time with the S23 Ultra and I've done enough time with the iPhone 15 Pro Max to really compare them. If you guys are on the verge of buying either or, I figured talking about them from someone that genuinely likes both of them would probably help you. I'm at the point that I think I'll start labeling myself as an ex-Apple fanboy. Truthfully, these are just both great phones, but each phone suits a particular type of person. And all of that very much starts with the OS. I do find iOS apps tend to be a lot more optimized for its hardware and software. It makes things feel slightly faster. However, this doesn't mean Android isn't snappy or fast. Not even once throughout my whole experience that I ever thought, damn, my user experience is kinda sluggish, especially not after playing with some developer settings that allow me to make my phone feel quicker. And just that, ladies and gentlemen, is why I love Android. Like the ability to provide simple things like maintenance mode or apps like Good Luck that allow you to customize your home screen, the app drawer and keyboard. Plus Android also delivers a great multitasking workflow. Customizing your phone and your experience just doesn't end. And look, I get it, I get it. iPhone people like to get up and running quickly. It's almost like iOS is bulletproof. Things just work out of the box, as some people may say. The thing is that One UI also just works. And on top of that, it's able to deliver greater customization features to really cater a phone exactly the way you want it. It's almost like you're setting it up to have a very personalized experience through Android. And there's a whole ecosystem to discover out there, especially if you are like me and your workflow heavily depends on Google apps. The connectivity between Android and PCs, including Chromebooks is great. On my PC, I use either Intel Unison or Phone Link to transfer pictures and answer texts. On Chromebook, Phone Hub is even better. You can sync chat notifications, share files, send and receive text messages, share your phone's internet. Actually, I got Best Buy to send us this Asus Chromebook Plus CM3401 for us to test. Google have put together a new standard for devices labeled Chromebook Plus. You get twice the processing power, twice the RAM, and twice the standard 64 gigabytes of storage they are used to having. It makes this AMD Ryzen 3 with 8 gigabytes of RAM and 128 gigabytes of storage a great pick for folks looking for a casual solid laptop. The standard also needs to meet requirements such as having a full HD IPS display and a 1080p webcam with noise reduction. Chromebooks in general also allow you to hit the ground running out of the box. You benefit from never having a virus and a 10 hour long lasting battery life. With this laptop, you also get to enjoy a versatile thin and light design with a 360 degree hinge, making it perfect for various tasks and on the go usage. Laptops like this are capable of quite some with Google's AI technology and this new specification. Exclusive features like the AI powered magic eraser that easily removes unwanted background distraction is one of them, having video call controls, dynamic wallpapers and screen savers, access to different types of Adobe products like Photoshop and Lightroom, even the ability to work on some light video editing with LumaFusion. Look, starting at $399 for anything office or web related, a Chromebook is going to do wonders. If you're interested in connecting your Android device to Google's new Asus Chromebook Plus CM3401, I'll leave a link down below for you guys. So for the months I've had this, I love the fact that 
every single issue I had with the OS had a solution. And not only that, but it had ways to make it even better. I feel like iOS is just behind in that aspect. Every year we get features that already existed on Android. Yes, I will admit the home screen and the widgets you can add to it are nicer in my opinion. They also are trying to bring proper interactive widgets to the home screen. Dynamic Island is really useful in some case scenarios like keeping up with flights and alarms. But lately things just aren't as exciting as they used to be and iOS is still very limited. Just the fact that we don't have a proper file system is annoying. Meanwhile, the Ultra feels like a mini computer, especially when it's paired with a feature like Samsung DeX. Now that I'm looking back at this, I think the only feature I really miss from the iPhone is FaceTime. I really thought it was going to be hard to let go of iMessage and AirDrop, but honestly, after a while I realized I didn't really need it, especially because my whole ecosystem revolves around Google. I do need to point out though, that sending images and video through iMessage is by far easier and way better. As someone that lives in North America where people tend to have more iPhones than Android devices, it's annoying not being able to send a proper video or photo through messages without crippling the quality. Not everyone here has WhatsApp. Yeah, I mean, for me, the Apple ecosystem is like a force of habit, something you get used to it and that's it. But that doesn't mean that the Android ecosystem can deliver things just as well. It's almost like an excuse given in order to avoid trying something new, which is fine. Comfort is good in some cases. And if you prefer that, then that doesn't make it wrong. But I still think that you guys are missing out. And what I mean about you guys is iPhone users. So OS wise, I think Android is starting to take over iOS. Um, now that we are on the topic of comfort, let's talk about design. To me, both of these phones feel different, like the typing experience and the way my hands grip around the phones is totally distinct from one another. The S23 holds a bit less sharp, and what I mean by that is that without a case, because the edges are a bit more refined compared to the iPhone, it digs less into your fingers as you're typing. And for some odd reason, it gives you that sensation that it's slimmer. I think it's simply because it's a tad longer, but regardless of that, on the other hand, I've come to appreciate the titanium frame, not because it's lighter, but because to me it's it, it looks better and the finishing on it is a lot more appealing compared to a stainless steel. So yeah, I mean, we're talking about 221 grams versus 234 grams. And to tell you the truth, in terms of weight, they just both feel the same to me. I think something that people fail to realize is that you're going to be rocking these phones with a case and probably some MagSafe accessories, if any. So it's almost like everything I just mentioned right now goes out the window, except one thing I'm about to add. The S23 corners dig into your hand. No matter the case you use, that's one thing that annoyed me during my ownership experience. The corners can definitely feel sharp, making the phone a tad more boxier. And this is where I would draw my initial statement. And now I can say that the phone does feel sharper, whether you have a case or you don't especially while consuming content vertically. I will give it to the iPhone, the rounded corners are definitely nice and it's something I've missed. However, it's not all sunshine and rainbows because the fact that the new repairability design allows for the back cover to crack easier is uh, sort of worrisome. The reason as to why that happened is simply because unlike last year, the back plate this time around does not include an aluminum frame compromising the structural integrity of the glass. Apparently they designed it that way because they wanted a new structural frame. This design allows for the backplate to easily be replaced. And so for $200, for those who don't have Apple Care, you can easily get that replaced. But it's almost like they created a problem to sell a solution. And according to The Verge, well, it's not only that. Even though the iPhone 15 Pro Max is easier to repair, the teardown from iFixer reveals that it still comes with some constraints, making it really difficult for DIYers and independent repair shops to recover functionality. However, the S23 Ultra is no angel. From my own experience, my first real drop with this phone was an automatic crack. My screen shattered right away. And because I didn't get Samsung Care Plus, 
well, I had to pay like $400 to get it repaired. A lot of people online seem to be complaining about the durability that Gorilla Glass Victus 2 has to offer. I'm sort of one of them, but I keep telling myself maybe it's the way like it, it fell with the angle and everything. Yeah, I might have been just that unlucky, honestly. I just find it sucks because with the amount of times I've dropped my previous iPhones, I never ever cracked a screen. Although, I am happy to say that Samsung customer service is elite, absolutely amazing. If I remember correctly, I gave them my phone on a Saturday. The girl at the booth took really good care of me. She explained to me the repair procedure, how to put my phone in maintenance mode, and took down my number. On Tuesday, my phone was ready for pickup. They even fixed my USB-C port that had water damage from when I went to Portugal. That one was um, a bit of my fault, I have to admit that. Yeah, I sort of went to Portugal and then I broke my port right over there with the water. Um, and then it wouldn't stop displaying this little notification water drop icon every time I would plug it in. I thought it would go away after a few weeks, but it didn't. It actually completely stopped charging for me, so I ended up getting a fast charge wireless pad. I tried to clean the damn port as much as I could and I even tried to dry it. A bit useless because it had been weeks since I was back from Portugal. Anyways, I think the mix of the water by the beach and the sand destroyed the port. From my own research, it seems like people have been having the same issues, their phones not charging, but even lint can cause that. But the same thing happens on the iPhone. I bring this up because it makes me wonder if the lightning port is more durable than USB-C ports. But look, now that both phones have USB-C, which one's better? I sort of have to give this one to Android. I mean, this actually has super fast charging capabilities. Don't get me wrong, the iPhone still charges incredibly fast, but the S23 Ultra beats it by 10 minutes from a 40% start. And keep in mind, the S23 Ultra has a bigger battery that can charge at 45 watts compared to the iPhone's 4,422 milliamp battery that charges at 25 watts. You know what's funny though, even though the S23 Ultra charges slightly faster, the iPhone's USB-C port transfer speeds are kinda way better than the Samsung's. It's, it's not weird, I mean we are comparing Samsung's USB 3.2 Gen 1x1 port to the iPhone USB 3.2 Gen 2x1 port. In other words, we are comparing speeds of 5GB per second to 10GB per second. Conclusion to my thoughts, I guess charging speed has nothing to do with transfer speeds. With that in mind, I ran quick import and export tests with my T7, the iPhone, and the S23 Ultra just to show you some results. With this being formatted in XFAT, using a fully licensed Intel Thunderbolt 3 cable, and transferring a total of 26 gigabytes, these were my exact results. Honestly, for me, as an iPhone 15 Pro Max regular user, this only matters if I'm shooting log into a physically connected SSD. But I will say I appreciate the S23 Ultra for charging slightly faster. A slight improvement for me is a slight improvement. Now, let me mention something that we might all relate to. There's nothing more stressful than seeing your S23 Ultra below 10%. That 10% feels more like 1%. Oh god, does that drain quickly. When the iPhone shows 10% for me, I know I'm still good for quite some, but in the S23 Ultra, damn, that 10% does not last long. However, both batteries to me, without running tests, by just looking at my battery stats, they feel identical. At first, I really thought the iPhone 15 Pro Max really sucked until my genius self realized that it was because I was shooting log more often than not and I was taking a lot more pictures compared to my S23 Ultra. But in general, both phones perform the exact same way. I'd say on average, I get about 11 hours of active screen time for both phones or one day and five hours like my S23 Ultra shows. Regardless, just to paint you guys a picture, I have a bad tendency of not charging phones at night. I tend to wake up with my phones being at around 20% from a full battery being charged the morning before, and that 20% can last me for half a day with very, very moderate use, meaning that I'm not out there shooting photos and videos and so on. This brings me to my next topic and my favorite topic, 
the cameras. So let's talk cameras. The S23 Ultra has three main lenses, an ultra wide 12 megapixel lens, a main camera capable of up to 200 megapixels, a telephoto camera delivering 10x capabilities at 10 megapixels, and a telephoto 3x camera at 10 megapixels. The 15 Pro Max on the other hand has an ultra wide 12 megapixel lens camera, a main camera capable up to 48 megapixels, and a 5x telephoto camera delivering images at 12 megapixels. Let me just start by saying that damn, I miss the iPhone video capabilities more now than ever with log. The fact that I can now shoot log on a phone like this and color grade it with the same tools we use for our FX3 is insane. For the longest time, iPhone has always been a step ahead Samsung's video capabilities, like video selfies on the iPhone look better, the fact that video sharpening is not much of a thing in iOS compared to One UI is great, or a feature like 8K on the S23 Ultra which doesn't look better by any means than standard 4K ProRes on the iPhone. But there's something so natural about the overall color palette when it comes to the S23 Ultra, especially in photography. Like skin tones always look natural natural and not washed out. The yellows, orange, and reds tend to pop a lot more. Grass looks like it's more alive on simple photos. Like for your average consumer, this is so good. It makes pictures feel like they are more alive. This is the biggest thing I've realized when it comes to run and gun photography. But sometimes I will say it can backfire. And as much as it likes playing with colors and smoothing out faces, iPhone can make things look a bit more realistic at times. Now, aside from the colors, in terms of the implementation of this new hardware and this new software, Apple can finally compete with the zoom capabilities of the S23 Ultra. The 5X telephoto lens that only comes with the Max is amazing. It's the equivalent of having a 120mm periscope lens. It really blows the 5X zoom of the S23 out of the water. Although you then compare the 3x zoom of the Samsung unit and it really destroys the iPhone, 10x for both phones are great with the S23 Ultra having a slight upper hand, the ultra wide as well in my opinion, it's just slightly better than the iPhone regardless of their 12 megapixel capabilities. In terms of the main camera, I like the iPhone better mainly because at 24 megapixel it does feel sharper and more detailed than the standard 12 megapixel camera on the S23. On top of that, iOS now allows to have different focal lengths at 24 millimeters, 28 millimeters, and 35 millimeters. Because these are digital zoom, expect for the images to look just slightly worse, but again, these are still very well processed. I'm not gonna sit here and pretend that I shoot my pictures in 24 megapixels on the main camera because I don't. The same story goes with the Samsung. I feel like the 50 megapixel mode is so underrated. I think 50 megapixel is the sweet spot for the S23 Ultra because it's the mode that decently keeps its dynamic range without having to sacrifice quality. 200 megapixel is good and all, but the dynamic range is not the best. And honestly, those files are massive. So yeah, when I can, I take advantage of either the 48 megapixel on the iPhone or the 50 megapixel on the S23. With all of this being said, at the end of the day, as a pro user, to be honest, I usually always end up importing my pics to Lightroom Mobile and edit them. That's a whole iPhone camera settings and setup video for next week. But yeah, to round off cameras, they are both great. I do think iPhone is slightly better in video and the S23 is slightly better for photos. But in terms of UI, I have to give it to the iPhone. I find the camera app to be a lot easier to use one-handed and it tends to be a bit more responsive, especially with shutter lag and zoom speeds. The last thing I miss about my Android device is the display. The iPhone still has a gorgeous display, don't, don't get me wrong. After all, it's made by Samsung, it's just that it's not tuned the same way in my honest opinion. I find the S23 Ultra display to be sharper and more color accurate, like even though it only has 1750 nits of peak brightness, compared to 2000 peak nits from the iPhone, it still feels more vibrant. We're comparing a 6.7 inch OLED display to a 6.8 inch OLED display, two displays that still deliver 120 hertz and only have a PPI difference of about 40. 
Outside, both phones are very useful under extreme sunlight. I don't particularly find the S23 Ultra to be a lot dimmer. It sort of always felt the same to me. It's capable and bright outside. I mainly realized this when I was at the Monza GP in Italy and I was streaming the F1 race on my phone under the scorching sunlight. The bezels on the iPhone are slimmer this year. That is something I did realize. It really does feel like it's about to become borderless. So that's very nice. I would say it's practically the same experience as on the S23 Ultra, especially viewing 16 by nine content. I don't find the dynamic island or the punch hole to get in the way of your content, but when it does, it just feel like it's part of your screen, especially on the iPhone since the dynamic island is an interactive tool to be used with an iOS. I think you'll realize I didn't talk much about the action button. Look, it's cool. I actually programmed it in a way that it would make my life easier with certain tasks. I like that about Apple. I love shortcuts and I love how you can code things to make them work the way you want it to. Although for me, it's not more than just a new feature. It shouldn't be the reason as to why you should buy one over the other. I personally think I went over factors that should influence your buying process. I could talk forever about other stuff, don't get me wrong. It would be a 40 minute video, but if you are currently trying to decide for yourself, I think these are the things to watch out for. If any of you have other recommendations and other topics you think are worth mentioning, please just leave them down below. It'll greatly be appreciated by some people. Next week, we've got my camera setup video for the iPhone. I'm making a whole movie, so watch out for that. I gotta go pack for that because I'm catching a plane. So yeah, take care guys. I'll see you all soon. Peace.